I'll put that back up there. Can you hear me? If you really want to get the, the most you can out of this, you need to move forward, because I'm going to do things to people tonight, and very strange things, and you really want to see what's going to go on. So you need to move forward, otherwise you'll miss the best part of this. All right? Those of you who are religious, we have no back row Baptists in this room today. Y'all move forward. Everybody come aboard. That's my first social engineering of the night, by the way. <laughs> Making everybody move. So, yeah, I'm Luke. Um, I've done a lot of things, and we're going to have some fun tonight. Uh, during this talk, you'll see me speed through a lot of these slides, because some of it's just theory. You can go back and you can take it and do what you want to do with it. Uh, learn yourself. Social engineering is a technique that you always have to improve and, and do a lot of self-learning with. Um, I'll also give you some anecdotes, which contain some secrets in them of things you might want to try as a social engineer. And then we'll get through the early part of these slides pretty quick and get to some what I call Jedi mind tricks, things that you can do to improve your social engineering. So we're doing the upfront stuff right now. I'm going to give you the first four of these really fast, and we're going to get down here. Because this is what you guys are really here for. God, this microphone's really loud. Right. Um, the things that you will take out of here are a little bit structure to your social engineering. We're going to talk about a social engineering equation that I use to help you kind of encapsulate what you do and how you do it so that you know you're making successful social engineering attacks. We're going to tour some of the psychology because it is important. Bottom line, just like you have NMAP and you have Metasploit, Psychology is the tools for both your reconnaissance and your exploitation that drive these things. Um, clearly, to be successful, you have to understand your attack vectors. We're going to survey some social engineering technologies. I have my best list because if you go out there and you try to learn social engineering, there's a thousand names for the things that we're going to talk about tonight. I've tried to composite those into what I call my best social engineering technologies list. There's no way in heck we can go through those tonight. Some of these things, in fact, this whole kind of presentation is a two to four day class um, in terms of actually implementing and using some of these techniques. And then I'm going to give you five functional goal strategy combinations to begin think about so that you're not just kind of spraying your social engineering out there. And then we'll get to the fun. Actually, we'll have fun throughout it. The key of this talk is a lot of the social engineering that I see go on in penetration assessments these days um, is what I call passive or um, defensive or even kind of implicit social engineering. You're doing a phishing attack. You take an email and you send it out to 10,000 people or you set up a website and they let you come to, to, to the website and you social engineer from there. Sometime in your career, at some point in time, and unfortunately for me, I've had to do this at times when it's a life and death situation. You're going to be face to face or near face to face, and you've got to change the equation. That's the only way you're going to get beyond where you're at. And when you're doing face to face social engineering, it's not something you get to sit back for a week and go, let me write this great email. And let me send it out to 10,000 people, and I'll get my 1% or 5% or 6%, whatever your characteristic statistic is, um, you know, for that type of phishing attack. Now, this is one-on-one. -on -one. You've got to go up against somebody else, and very quickly, you've got to change the equation. And that's the goal today. And honestly, with the five tricks that we're going to talk about today, you can change the equation. And you can become very successful social engineers. You can read the rest of this stuff. Actually, does anybody want to volunteer as a finger button monkey? Come on, somebody volunteer. I promise I won't hypnotize you while you're doing that. Come on up here. I move around a lot. I'm very kinetic. Um, and we'll talk about kin kinesthetic and vid visual and audio people. So I'll be all over the room, and I'll have to figure out where I can stand relative to these speakers. Um, but go ahead, go to the next slide. You'll hear me go, 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 go here in a minute. So why me? Uh, this has been a lifelong passion of mine. You know, I'm in the sixth grade and I'm writing about biofeedback because it just, I love the mind. The mind is a very interesting thing. 
Um, I did spend 20 years in the intelligence, special operations, law enforcement. Those are the places that I've had to use this real world, but I've also, outside of those places, and I'll tell you a story in a minute, have had to do the same thing. I'm a certified hypnotist. Um, I have a ninja background. Don't ask me how, it's a long story. But one thing I want you to take away from this slide is just because I am these things, I'm not always these things. And one of the things that you'll have to develop as your own kind of protocol as you become a successful social engineer is learn how to turn this stuff off. Because at the end of the day, you will kill yourself if you do this 24 seven, and you'll kill the relationships around you. Because we're gonna go ahead to the next slide. Because this slide is true. There's a lot of dirty, dastardly, covert, powerful things that if you get skilled in some of these areas, you can do to people. Do not believe that a hypnotist cannot make somebody do what they're not willing to do. I can. I have done it. That's not to mean that they're bad people. It's just everybody has holes in their personality. And if I can find that hole and I can pivot off that hole, you guys pivot all the time, don't you? Same thing in the brain, pivot off that hole, I can go where I want to go. And you don't even have to hypnotize people to do that. We'll talk about some technologies like cold reading and neuro-linguistic programming. I can do them and you'll never know they're done. Six days from now, I'll come back and do it again to you, you'll never know it's done. Okay. So use it at your own risk. I didn't get permission from Marvel Comics for the great Spider-Man comment there. Um, if you're practicing, do it with people you're safe with, because you're gonna screw up. Anybody know how to tell a good demo man or a good terrorist? Good demo man, not terrorist, will miss one of these two fingers on one of their two hands. Because if you crimp blasting caps 10,000 times, one of them's gonna go off. So you crimp them and holding them like this. This is a blasting cap that when you do it 10,000 times, one of them's gonna blow up on you. So do it with people when you're practicing that you're safe with, that's consensual, that you can step back, that you can go time out, or that you can both go have a beer and laugh about it later. You do it to your boss, and it blows up on you. Welcome to the unemployment line. Go ahead. Now, a key thing that I want to bring across in, in the talk tonight, and the reason why I kind of put this together to begin with, was a lot of people in this room, like me, are introverts. It's the nature of our business. We like to work alone. We like to work by ourselves. We like to do things. In social settings, outside of maybe the social groups we form, they take energy away from us. And that's the true definition of introvert. It's not shy. It's not that you're not socially adept. It's that as a person, when you're in a social setting, at the end of that setting, you feel drained. Extroverts feel full. This is what the true definition of introvert and extrovert. What I say and what I've learned watching people over the years and what I've learned through my own kind of introspection on this is unlike the belief that a good social engineer has to be, you know, Pastor Bob, who's very charismatic and can get everybody saying hallelujah at the same time. Hallelujah. There you go. All right. Introverts are better at this. Why? Why do introverts walk away from a social situation feeling drained? There you go. Introverts are people who are hypersensitive to the social cues that are going on. You walk into a room and you will feel 10,000 sensors going off, even with no one speaking. And if you're hypersensitive, that means you can pick up on the subtle things that an extrovert won't. Have you ever noticed that great sales guys, good extroverts, right? All of them, every one of them, almost to the, to the T they also are social morons. They will say, you know, F you in the middle of church and think it's okay. 
And everybody around them will go, well, that wasn't okay, but I'm not going to say anything because he's a very social person. And they're not, they're not being mean or wrong. Thing is, they don't have the, the social cues. They're not getting them. And their, bra their brain just told their you know, mouth to say, mm -hmm, yeah. So they're not quite as good. Every one of you in the room as an introvert or close to an introvert, if you're in this profession, have a gift. You can do good face-to-face -face social engineering beyond anything that, you, that salespeople do. You just have to hone other skills. And you have to make the decision step beyond that kind of factor of this is going to take away from me, I'm not good at this, and just go do it. Flip on to the next slide. All right, before we get into this, I'm a skinny, scrawny, not now, 19-year-old kid. Um, back then, which was the dinosaur age, actually working as an orderly in a, in a hospital, we got to do a lot of stuff, stuff that people would go to jail for today. And the hospital I happened to be working in was the county hospital that had the entire first floor dedicated to all of the psychiatric patients in the county, which the majority of that census were people who were criminals, drug addicts, um, very extreme sociopaths, uh, you know, a lot of very abnormal behavior. Now, I typically work the night shift, so I would oftentimes be one of the few men who were in the building as well. And we got a code red on the first floor, which got a boogie down there because probably bodies are flying at that point in time. And at the end of the hall were the two isolation rooms, or rubber rooms as they were commonly called, and I see a herd of people outside of one which is normally my visual cue to head toward that one. And I head toward it dutifully, run in, get through the door, and I'm not a foot in, I hear kadook, and turn around, and the door shut behind me. And there's 10 nurses looking in this little portal this big going, get him, get him. Which makes me want to turn and go, and there's a young man about my age, who has had a lot of behavioral problems and also has a pretty good criminal history and was in isolation. I had worked with him before during that week. And he somehow decided to figure out how to make a metal shiv. And he's in this room and he turns and looks at me and I turn and look at him and he proceeds to tell me he's gonna kill me. Which was a little bit astonishing since there are 10 people outside the door gonna watch me get killed. So I begin to circle this person in the room and we're kind of like in this little dance, going round and round and I'm trying to kind of you know, get my wits about me for a second. And I realize while my brain is working on this equation, his mouth is explaining how he's gonna dismember me and how he's gonna peel my skin off and make a hat out of it. And so my brain kind of comes back to reality for a minute. And I look and I'm kind of waiting for a second to see if there's other help that's going to come, there's no help. And it's a small room, it's a 11 by 11 cell. So we continue to do this for quite, I'd say 10 minutes. And finally I kind of go, okay, no help's coming, I'm on my own, this guy has a weapon, he's a healthy young man and he's crazy. Bum rushing is not a good choice at this point in time, all right? So I just kind of kneeled down and I noticed in the corner there was a can of skull. And I kind of looked at him, I said, yeah, you're gonna kill me. But before I die, can I have a dip of that skull? I'm kind of needing some right now. Now you gotta understand, I'd never dipped in my life, so I had no clue what I was in for at this point in time. <laughs> I just knew that that was some way to get this guy off of explaining how he was gonna skin me like a deer. And he kicks it over to me, goes, yeah, I'll let you have some, since I'm gonna kill you. So I take a good old dip, I shove it in there. And I don't know what shocked me more, the immediate rush of tobacco to my head or the reality that I had about two minutes before that tobacco peeled the inside of my brain away and I no longer had thought processes to work with, okay? So I had to start working quick. And I, and I kicked the can back over to him. I said, well, why don't you join me since you know, you're gonna kill me anyway. We might, might as well both enjoy this. And he, squats down, picks up the skull, and takes a big dip, and we kind of look at each other for a minute. He finally says, 
you're a good guy. And I go, well, thank you. He goes, I don't think I'm going to kill you. I go, well, thank you again. <laughs> I go, but we have a problem because they're not going to let me out of this room until I take that knife away from you. And I'm thinking at this point in time, the next thing out of his mouth is how he's going to kill me again. Doesn't happen. He looks at me, he goes, no, I think, um, I think I'll give you the knife. And he just hands the knife over to me. I said, well, you know, we're, these people are going to come in. We're going to have to do this. I start explaining things to him. He goes, I'm, I'm cool with that. Now, I can tell you a thousand times in hospitals, I've seen this done. I've done it myself. That would have normally ended up being a fight, five or six people coming in that room. In reality, all this guy needed was somebody to interact with for a moment, to calm his tone down. And we'll talk about the whole series of techniques that I applied there. Unfortunately, I cannot claim to fame that I applied any of those knowingly. That was pure instinct and survival at that point in time. And I was way too young. So, my social engineering equation. There are three key things that go into a good social engineering from your um, offensive, your motivation and understanding that, their motivation, excuse me. The attack vectors, where you're applying this the technologies that you're gonna to apply to this. And then that is all encapsulated inside of the strategy slash goals that you're going after. And if you focus your social engineering attacks with this in mind, you will be very successful every time. And I created a little acronym here. We love those, don't we? All right, go on. All right, this is where we're gonna move fast. So there are four, yeah, four, four great psychologists that constitute everything that came out of psychology that you hear, okay? Freud, Jung, Maslow, and Pavlov. They, the, three, the top three pretty much tell you what you need to know in terms of reconnaissance of your target. The bottom guy is both reconnaissance, but he's also how do you exploit that target quickly. All of these things go in, go ahead. All these things contribute to understanding the motivations. So Freud basically gives you the idea of, is this person in a id state, an ego state, or a superego state? And how do they move, motivate and operate inside of each of those states? He's the who am I of psychology. Jung gave us these archetypes, okay? And those archetypes have actually, the original kind of core Jungian archetypes have been changed, modified. The best one, there's 10 dozens of them today. The best one that I use is very commonly and very easily to understand is the Myers-Briggs. I highly recommend all of you go out there and figure out what your Myers-Briggs is. It'll tell you a lot about yourself, actually. And, and this is the what am I of psychology when you're trying to look at the motivation. Go ahead. Maslow. Maslow fundamentally says, where is this guy in terms of his needs, desires, wants, and everything else, you know? If I'm attacking someone and they haven't eaten in a week, that's a real simple attack. A trip to McDonald's and 10 or 15 bucks and I've got whatever information I need. If they're an alcoholic and they're, you know, they're hooked on alcohol to the point that they're not getting off of it in your lifetime, giving them that back. I'll tell you, that sounds a little bit crude, taking an alcoholic and using it. Doctors do it all the time. You have an alcoholic or, or a uh, drug addict go into a hospital for a major surgery, they're gonna keep them high. Because you do more harm to the person taking them off the drugs while you're working on them than you do keeping them on the drugs. And quite frankly, from seeing tens of thousands of people in this domain of Addiction, you're not going to fix their addiction until they decide they're going to fix it. But Maslow basically says, you know, what's my physiological state? Where am I in my safety factor? Love, self-esteem, actualization. And until the lower things are met, people don't start operating in this sphere up here. So if you go and you try to motivate somebody who hasn't eaten with, wouldn't it be wonderful? They're going to look at you like you're a Martian. Go ahead. 
Pavlov. Pavlov is the most powerful man on the face of this earth. If he knew that he could have patented this, and he should have patented this, he, would, he and his heirs would be billion, trillion, quadrillionaires. Everything we do, everything we know, everything we are somehow comes out of classical conditioning. I can tell you when we get to talking about NLP, everything that I'll talk about with anchoring in NLP is classical conditioning. I just got a new puppy, classical conditioning. Do it all the time. Give him a treat, he sits down. Give him a bowl of water, he waits until I tell him to go. He's conditioned. We are too. Let me say a real quick thing. PTSD, it's not a disorder, it's classical conditioning. Happens to everyone all the time. You have anxiety for some reason you can't figure out. It's because somewhere, some stimulus anchored that anxiety state for some reason. It could be as simple as a color green. You happen to be looking at a color green when the car hits you from the side, green will make you, make you anxious. And how people sometimes anchor these things is weird and, and kind of different. So, you know, I could be looking at the same color green, but what I anchored to was the fact that I saw the car out of the corner of my eye. Okay? Go ahead. And Pavlov's the how do I become. So, to put this in hacker's terms, these guys are your end map and your metasploit. Freud, Jung, and Maslow are your end map. Your id, ego, super, that's like picking your operating system. You know, your id's your Microsoft, your ego is your Linux, and your super ego is your Mac, all right? <laughs> Maslow tells you what ports are open, and it kind of looked like that, didn't it? Remember the port diagrams we always see? That's kind of the port. It's where are you? What things can I come in and talk to you about that you're gonna hear? If you're hungry, you're not going to hear something about meeting some goal, you know, super goal in life, right? You're going to look at me and go, I'm hungry. Feed me. Okay? And Young tells you what services are available in that. My archetype, I'm a mechanic archetype, ISTP. Okay? I'm also, I'm borderline, so I'm not borderline, borderline, guys. I'm, board, I'm borderline between these types, all right? And ISTP is a mechanic. Mechanics like to do things. We like to, like, we're good with our hands. You give us any tool, we'll figure it out. Nobody, I, I could never figure out in the military, you could hand me a gun. In fact, the British SAS pulled this on me one time. We came out of the field, and I don't know how many of y'all know anything about ARs, but ARs break down to five basic pieces to fill, clean them, and strip them, okay? This guy goes, I tell you what, let's trade guns. I want to learn about your AR. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. This is back when they had the bullpups issue. This frickin' bullpup broke down into 500 pieces I had laid out in an armory from one end of the building to the other. Okay, I got social engineered on that one. <laughs> All right. And Pavlov is your metasploit. How do you exploit these things? Everything you're gonna learn to exploit in social engineering is gonna hinge around anchoring and building some sort of anchoring system. If I want you to automatically begin to sit in this seat, you know, I'm gonna slowly condition you to move toward that seat. I may start with coming over here and standing really close to you in an uncomfortable manner in a way that most men should never stand between each other. <laughs> And if you don't take that clue, I might begin to kind of like bend my knees and get really close to places and make you really uncomfortable until you kind of shift your seat over, right? Now he knows that, so he's not doing it. <laughs> tricky, tricky. All right. But slowly you'll move over here. Got a great game. How many of you are single in here? Too bad. Next time you're in a social setting at a restaurant, play the salt and pepper chess game. It's fun, okay? So you're sitting across from somebody, figure out what that imaginary midline is between the two of you. Slowly, subtly, without making a big deal of it, you know, act like you're throwing a little salt or pepper on your thing, and set that shaker right at the midline, and watch what happens. 
Then, a few minutes later, pick up the salt, whichever one you didn't pick up. Act like you shake a little bit of it. Set it just barely across the, don't go far. I mean, don't go, you know, don't get all crazy. Just barely across that midline. By the end of the meal, you can have a person sitting away from the table in an inordinate distance and leaning as far away as you want them to lean simply by moving salt and pepper shakers around to the table. You can do the same thing if you want their attention, pulling their stuff towards you. Okay? But play the salt and pepper game next time. Go ahead. Okay, tag vectors. Very simple, three Ps, people, process, and perspective. All the other ones that you can come up with are based on some combination of these. Okay, people, human beings, the human in the equation. Processes, we're gonna get into this, and I'll give you some acronyms to remember the key things around this in a minute. Our laws, regulations, their internal processes, whatever, and perspectives are their emotional states, their self-actualization states, um, the organizational and entity states, the aggregate state of the group, group think. Okay, go ahead. So people attack vectors. Omar and, was it Rob or Ron? Rob. Rob, we're talking about these two things. I thought, God, this is great. They're like right before me. Every insider threat forms out of one of these things, fear, lust, anger, greed, or sympathy. This is what every intelligence operative is taught in the field to turn somebody as an asset. Fear, whether it's real or perceived, a meta-fear, an actual fear. Meta-fears are, I feel failing. I feel I'll let my dad down, you know. They're meta-fears that we have out there. Lust is real simple, guys. It's sex, sex, and more sex. Lust, and there's some lust-like things like envy, which also kind of have to do with greed. And you kind of got to understand where it's coming from. Is it a physi physical kind of interaction, greed, lust thing? Then that's probably more lust, OK? Anger, uh, anger felt, anger received. What do I mean by anger received? Got a clue on that? Anger felt's easy, right? I'm pissed off. A lot of those insider things you saw were people who were pissed off, weren't they? Okay? Anger received is... <laughs> You're motivated right now, aren't you? <laughs> to get away from me. <laughs> That's anger received. It could be as simple as that. And a lot of times that gets injected people into situations. When you're closing an asset as an intelligence asset, a lot of times they're on that edge. You push that anger button, push them over the limit. Get them in there. Greed is money, things having to do with money. It could be a car instead of money. It could be you know, a nice house. But it's whatever their greed is. It could also be their former greed or their greed state. They've gone out. They've gotten themselves in a lot of debt. Now you're bailing them out of that. And sympathy is affiliation to a cause, love, empathy, and moral virtues. Believe it or not, moral virtues can be a downfall of people. And one thing I recommend to everybody, if they're going to you know, become good social engineers, is get beyond, understand, or get beyond the kind of moral, moral things are off limits. No, they're not. Remember that there was an entire nation that I can tell you right now, all those people in that nation were not evil people. They got behind evil people in Nazi Germany, weren't they? Because of their moral beliefs that were transferred to them. Moral virtues can get out of control. All right, next. Process, fire, flow, identity, rules, and environment. Okay, when you look at a process attack, you want to look at the flow. Can I change the flow? Can I use the flow steps to stop what's going on because this isn't working from a social engineering attack? What is the chain of command and custody that goes with that flow? Okay, let me talk to your supervisor. This isn't working. Okay. Identity. Who owns the process? What's the leadership of execution? The role of the person involved relative to that? 
So you're inside of a process. Do you have the power to do that? No, you don't. Okay, I need to speak to somebody who has the power to do that. So you're not going to give me that, and you know I work for the CEO, right? You see how you're processing, you're, you're using identity in terms of a process attack here. Rules and laws, local, jurisdictional, um, internal, you know, political correctness natures, uh, in, internal complementary processes that may dictate things that have to go on. These are all important. You can stop something or, you know, transition something. I do this all the time with PII information when somebody I know who doesn't need it says, well, I really need your social security number. I go, well, I really need to see the safe that you're gonna keep that in and your PCI compliance and this and this because under federal law, state law, you know, I start spouting things off. They're like, oh, well, I don't really need it that bad. <laughs> That's a rule and law process attack. And then the environment. The environment plays a huge thing here. Time of day, the, you know, the organizational character. Do you guys know why these snake eater type people always do their missions between two and four o'clock in the morning? People suck at doing things between two and four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I don't care if you're a third shifter. So when I was with the Raleigh Police Department um, years ago, unfortunately they stopped this because it caused brain damage. We used to actually rotate shifts every two weeks. So we went from first shift to second shift to third shift. My supervisor one night calls me up. He goes, hey, meet me over here at so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so corner. I go, okay. So I get over there and I'm, I'm thinking I've been doing my job great. He goes, are you okay? I'm going, yeah, I'm fine, what's wrong? He goes, I just saw you drive through five red lights in downtown Raleigh. I had no knowledge of that. Between two and four o'clock in the morning, we didn't have cell phones back then. That's how old I am. <laughs> All right, <laughs> go ahead, next one. Okay, perspective attack, frack. Feelings, rationalizations, authority and character. Spending a little bit of extra time here because these are the things you need to understand when you're gonna set up your attack vectors. Feelings, your emotional context, persuasions, rationalization. Political correctness is a great tool for social engineers. If you haven't figured that out, go learn it. Logic is a great tool for social engineers. Wonderful tool. The problem is, is we're all logical thinkers in here and we think we can outlogic people and we bore them to death doing that, quite frankly. I'm just gonna tell you, okay? Real or perceived limits of authority, real or perceived sense of responsibility, moral background, um, the negativity or positivity. One of the things I liked on Rob's slide was it was talking about the environment, making it positive toward people making mistakes or acknowledging things that they've identified are broken, okay? One of the biggest things that sets any environment up is where you have this negative context, this, you know, okay, if anything's broken, everybody's in trouble. It's a guarantee to have your environment social engineer. In fact, I think it was Omar said, uh, detect, or what was it? Was it detect versus defend or something like that? Deter. deter, yeah, detect versus deter, you know, he had that argument. All those arguments are wrong. Activate, educate, and empower. That's the only way you will defeat social engineering. Activate your people, because they are thousands of them in any environment that can help you out. Educate them on what is right, what is wrong, and empower them to stop people and say, what are you doing? I walked through a Chinese manufacturing facility, it was an American manufacturer last year, for three days, that's the reason why I'm wearing a suit. I wore this black suit, that's all I did. I had no badge on, which I should have had a badge on. Nobody stopped me for three days, and the first person who did was the American. And when I said, oh yeah, I'm doing a security audit, he goes, okay, go ahead. And that's a cultural thing. I mean, I really couldn't blame them because it's inculcated in their culture. Go ahead. Oh, yeah.
Yeah. So the best set of social engineering technologies. Observation and intuition. Now you're going to say, duh. None of y'all do it right. We'll talk about it in a minute. Body language. Language in general. And this is a whole topic in and of itself. Hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming, conistry. We'll talk about that in a minute. And cold reading. From here down, we're not going to get too much in because they are truly dense topics. We'll briefly go over them and why I think they're important. From here up, we'll actually talk and they'll be part of some of the things that we do tonight with the Jedi mind tricks. Go ahead. So observation intuition. We all know that we're supposed to do these things. None of us do it right. You need to observe, observe, observe. You need to observe the nuances but not react to them. That's the biggest thing we do wrong. We observe something and we react to it. We'll talk about unbiasing in a minute. Unbiasing is the key to doing this. And when you learn to do an unbiased observation, you will see things you never thought you could, that, that you would have never seen there. Um, macro body positions, micro language, all of those things, I, you know, you'll build this repertoire. Most people have good intuition and introverts have great intuition as a, goal, as a general group. The problem is, is it is beat into us by our parents, society, and everybody else from day one. Don't believe your intuition. You don't have six senses. Well, you do. Your intuition is that sixth sense. It is that sixth sense. But you have to learn to listen to your intuition in a specific way. Not in the way of, OK, my gut is telling me this. Let me go do it. It's, OK, my gut's telling me this. That's something I need to bring into my environment as a tool now. Now let me understand what it's actually telling in the context of all the observations that I'm, I'm seeing here. And be able to control that intuition. Most of us react out of an anxiety-based intuition. In other words, our gut hurts. Oh, that, something's wrong here. Then just fix something. Your gut hurting may mean you just need to stay right in place right then and know more about what's going on in your environment. And your intuition, when you become a good social engineer, is the quiet thunder of doing this stuff. Because it will lead you to that one nuance that makes you realize this guy in the room right here is the guy that I'm going to be able to exploit. He doesn't like me pointing at him. <laughs> Go on. Go on. Body language. We've all heard all this mumbo jumbo about body language, a lot of it is. There's two kind of perspectives to body language. Most of what we hear is what I call the defensive perspective. In other words, what is Luke thinking right now by the way he's standing? Okay? I do that, but that's a small part of what I do with body language because guess what, people? You're going to presume my body language based on your, your structural concept in your mind. If you're a right-handed person, you will look at my body language as a right-handed person. If I'm a left-handed person, I may be doing the exact same body language you're doing, but because I'm doing it from a left-handed perspective, it looks something different to you. I may not have eaten tonight, and my body language may be modified slightly because I didn't eat. It may be cold in here, and I may be hugging myself, not because I'm withdrawing or I'm pulling back, I'm creating a context of distance, which you're taught that's normally what that means. It's just, I'm cold as hell. It's real simple. So defensive body language you take with a grain of salt. What you can do and what you can rely on is offensive body language. I, can, I know my intent. When I decide to use that intent, I can make it useful to me and I can convey that intent at least in a way that should be partially meaningful. Come on up here. You look like a good sucker. <laughs> All right? Just stand there like we're going to have a good conversation here, OK? Now, we're just going to sit here and talk. And outside of him feeling awkward right now, he's going to think this is a normal talking position. We both have our hands on our hips. We could be animated or whatever. And I mean, he's up here in front of a group, so that's a little bit awkward for him. He's got his backside to everybody. That's even more awkward for him right now. But I'm going to change the context slightly. Does that feel different to you? A little bit. Why? No idea. I moved one foot, three inches. Cops do this to you guys all the time, by the way. 
<laughs> it's a way we take control of a situation. You're taught to do this. All I did was take my foot. Same, foot was in the same alignment, but because we were neutral, both squared off, it meant nothing. As soon as I slide it slightly forward, it means I'm taking control. And your brain will register that. And most people in most situations, now he's primed because there's a room here, will actually kind of go like this. And you'll see their body kind of move back. That's offensive body language, people. You know, offensive body language um, can be used for constructive things. Yes or no? If you want to get picked up by a chick, or girls, if you want to get picked up by a dude, and you're having lunch or dinner with them, is it best to sit across from them face to face so you can have a healthy conversation? Why? Because you shouldn't talk to them? No, it's barrier. Some people think it's confrontational. If I put you in the right situation, it is. But it's barrier. It's that game I just talked about a minute ago. If I put us like this, we're now associated. So here's dating trick number one. Quit sitting across from your date. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> when we talk about anchoring later, you can actually use body position as an anchor. I don't have to even touch you. I don't even have to make a sound with you. I can anchor to you what, some context that I want you to repeat by simply standing in a certain consistent pattern to that. And every time I'm there, you return to that state. So if I'm subtly like bringing you into the context that I want you to be in, and I start anchoring that context to let's say we're standing side by side real close in a very chummy manner, and I love the beard. <laughs> yeah. He'll return to that state every time now. That's why, you know, we have these social norms that we develop, right? And when I moved over and bisected his body in a very unmanly way, <laughs> it created an unmanly context between us, right? So that's an anchor, you can anchor as well. Go ahead. Um, language, if you think what you say has no meaning, or if you think the types of words that you use have no meaning, or if you think language is just something that, you know, you, as my son used to say when he was dating, you spit your game, you're wrong. If you want to know the greatest tool that you can have, whether it's a phishing attack or whether it's actual social engineering, learn to read, hear, and know what's being said. Learn to control what you say. Now, we're going to talk about four things when we talk about language competence. The VKAD context of that, dominance and predominance, and VKAD is visual, kinesthetic, auditory, and a submodality of digital, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Tone and intonation, if I'm not talking with authority, if I'm talking like this up here, tone changes, changes the context, and content, the actual content, what did they say? Good social engineers learn to say what they need to say without saying it. The content is abstract. Um, the reason why language is so important is it not only tells us who we're dealing with, but gives us the pattern to change what we want. Who wants to volunteer? I'll actually be nice this time. Come on up here. All right. Turn around, face the audience. I'm going to take the microphone off for a minute. Okay. I want you to tell me, just tell me a fun thing that you did this past summer. I read a couple books. That's got to be more than one. Oh, sentence. okay. Um, Describe it. Let's see. Uh, I went to the beach and hung out with some of my family and my friends. And saw some movies while we were there. And did you like them? Or did you oh, yeah, they were all right. Okay. What type nothing of nothing did you incredible. Just you know, action. Did y'all hear the language he used? Go ahead and sit back down. 
How many times do you hear somebody when they're talking to you and they say, I feel like, did you see that? Now, we think that they're saying see because they're trying to convey a visual. They're actually conveying how they interpret the world is visual. Now, I can tell you that he is probably a kinesthetic auditory person. Those are his dominant systems. He probably likes a lot of music, don't you? Mm -hmm. You probably interact with the world with your hands a fair amount, don't you? How did I know that? I didn't hear anything visual in what he said, and he talked about going to a movie. The most visual thing you can go do. A little trick. Learn this, you'll get free beer all night long. I used to walk into bars and ask and tell the barmaid bartender, I'd say, if I can talk to you and in the next five minutes tell you 10 things that I don't know, that a stranger should never know about you, I get the free beer. I had one drop the beer mug and start beating the crap out of their co-bartenders because they thought they had told me all of this stuff. And it was by simply listening to the words that they used as I talked to them. Okay, go ahead. All right, uh, hypnosis and NLP. Hypnosis is the heavy form of NLP. They're kind of compatible systems. Um, hypnosis is based on all this stuff with hypnosis, guys, boils down to four kind of things. Getting the person's focus. And we are very defocused de de people as, a, as a, uh, an entity normally. So understand that when you're social engineering, you need to have focus. I have a trick with my dog that I do that, you know, when he's not paying attention, I put the treat at my head, I go, watch me. You know? That doesn't mean that you go up to the uh, motel operator who's checking you in and go, watch me. <laughs> They're probably gonna send the big guy who stands at the door and looks like he can beat the crap out of you over there to take you and escort you out of the place. Um, rhythm relaxation, and metaphor and visualization. Now, I want to talk about the metaphor and visualization for a minute. Even if you're the greatest hypnotist in the room, you can screw it up. Even if you can get people into, you know, drooling out the side of their mouth, hypnotic state, you can screw it up if you go in there and when you're, you know, you're trying to hypnotize them, you go, okay, what I want you to do now is bark like a dog when I throw the orange at you. Not going to work. You have to use visualization or their system. Visualization tends to be a, a very big one that most people have, and metaphor. So, in fact, when I'm checking in that line at a hotel and there's four or five people in front of me and they're a bunch of buttheads, you know, and they're like creating a lot of havoc for her or him, I'm not being sexist here, you know, I may step up to the thing because I want the suite room upstairs for the base room price today, I go, God, those people were horrible, weren't they? You know, why don't you just, before you deal with me, I want you to like, get, get rid of your stress right now. Because I, I, I couldn't, I mean, that's horrible stress you must have right now. Why don't you just look down at your keyboard for a minute right now and just kind of take a second and recoup? Just look at your keyboard there. Just take a look at your keyboard. Just take a deep breath for me. Take a deep breath. Just relax. I want you to be relaxed when you check me in because I don't, I don't want to be like these people behind me, okay? I want you to take a deep breath and I want you to relax. And I want you to relax and I want you to just let go of this stuff because nobody should be treated that way. Now, you know what? If I were you and you were checking in at a hotel right now, I would imagine that I wanted the same relaxed state that you're in right now. And I would want to treat everybody in that line as best as I possibly could. And I imagine that those people in line probably want the wonderful, most wonderful environment that, they're, you know, that you can provide them and great service. And when you do that, it's gonna make you feel better. And it's gonna make them happy and it's gonna make them smile at you. Nowhere in there does say, give me the room upstairs that's a suite. Did I? So when you start doing this, and none of y'all are going to walk out of here and be hypnotists tonight, but when you start doing some things with neuro-linguistic programming, you'll get to those states, and the thing that you want to avoid is just being the 
don't go try to own them. None of us like that and we'll all reject it, even in a hypnotic state. Neurolinguistic programming, there's a big psychological context behind this. It basically consists of rapport, some hypnotic concepts that are, that are in there, and it's all waking hypnosis, um, classical conditioning, and state language. State language is just you know, understanding the person's state and moving them between those states. Um, and it, this, is, this is magic, guys. There's a, I mean, if, if we had time tonight, we just don't. There's a um, quick phobia fix. Someone, who's, who's scared of snakes in there? Who's scared of spiders in there? I literally can walk you through a process in two minutes or less and put a snake or spider in your hand when you leave this room and you just walk out with like it was a pet. <laughs> it's that easy. That's the magic of the stuff, go ahead. Okay, conistry and cold reading. These are some kind of meta topics. I like reading about conistry because these guys have a science behind what we do as social engineers. They have a language, a programming language that describes that science. And they also have kind of the meta project plans. And in fact, their whole language is built around the different things, the different attacks that they do. And each one has its kind of own little plan around it. But here's some of that language and here's some of the plans. And they all know that in the end, you have to deal with what you've done. That's the key thing that conistry teaches that social engineers don't do all the time. Every great con will do these last three, thing, the last three things there, which is taking off the touch, blowing them off, and putting in the fix. Putting in the fix is the step that they do that makes sure that that guy that they just ripped off for $15,000 doesn't come hunt them down and kill them. And when you become good social engineers, even when you're doing this in a pen test, and you're social engineering the CEO or COO of a company, you don't want him to hunt you down and kill you. Okay. Cold reading is another one. Um, it's basically all the things you hear about, you know, palm reading and tarot cards and all that sort of stuff. Hokey pokey bullcrap, but it's actually science. It's actually a science of patter and talking to someone that you can covertly elicit amazing amounts of information, develop tremendous amounts of rapport, and also begin to have this person functioning as your agent. It's kind of, a, I use the language stuff that I was talking about earlier and cold reading together combined, that's how I get free beer. So go ahead. And now the final thing here is understand there's five goals that you can achieve with, with um, social engineering and there are five strategies that you need to build around those. Your five goal states can be people, actions, defense, information, and truth. There really is nothing else, okay? And each one of those has their own strategy. You need, it would take some, you know, whole night of talking about the strategies. Because when you're talking about people, are you trying to identify them as an asset? Are you trying to leverage them one time? Are you trying to turn them as an asset? There's lots of strategies that you have to implement around that. Actions, how do you go in in a very uh, precision surgical manner, get this action done, get out? Different strategy involved with that. Defense, you know, your social engineering attack has blown up and the third Mongolian horde of their police are coming over the hill, how do you stop that from happening? All right, go ahead. All right, now we're gonna jump into the Jedi mind tricks. Go for it. The first are the basics. And the first basic that you need to learn as a social engineer is unbiasing. Unbiasing is a gestalt technique that is very powerful, um, and even in interpersonal relationships, this is gonna help you tremendously. So how many times when you're in a, in a conversation do you run into a situation where you begin to feel yourself emotionally start increasing or decreasing because of the dialogue that's going on? Okay, when, uh, yeah, me too. If, if you've ever been in combat, and you actually have to shoot at somebody real bullets that they're shooting back, 
there's the same context that goes on. It's the context of tunnel vision. And what goes on with most conversations is tunnel vision. You start becoming emotionally engaged, you're not seeing the periphery. You're seeing that emotional engagement. It's either increasing or decreasing as a result of that. Unbiasing gives you a technique to stand off to the side and see everything that's going on. Both what you're saying, which is oftentimes very stupid, and what they're saying, which may be clues as to what you should be saying. But you're not hearing when you're in that emotional context. And the way you begin to prepare yourself to do this in contexts that are tense, rich, is every time you're interacting, day in, day out, you're at the water cooler talking to somebody, begin to think in the back of your mind so you create this little man that's standing off to the side watching you talk. Play that little mind game. After a while, it won't be artificial. You'll actually be sitting there having conversations with people going, what is that little man seeing? It's amazing. It's like two conversations going on in your head at the same time. Why do you want to do that? Now you're observing when you do that. You're not observing them, you're observing the entire context. You're observing the fact that you didn't hear that they were a visual person, and you're talking in an auditory language over here. Now just to aside before I get too much further with this, one thing, and I'll, everybody who's got a healthy or unhealthy relationship, I'm fixing to make it healthy tonight, healthier, okay? Understand, and we as introverts, hackers, computer people, logical people, we do this monstrously. When someone says to you, I feel bad about that, and that you, know, that you just didn't do what I wanted you to do, okay? It does not matter what logic you apply until you acknowledge and accept their perception of the world. And that's what an unbiasing allows you to do, is to begin to see the whole perceptual context that you need to look at. And to be a good social engineer, you have to do that. So start today in every conversation, little and big, have a third man off to the side looking at what's going on here. Now, I was just talking with him and having him talk, and I was having to do these five things, but how did I hear the things that you guys didn't hear? Because I got my little third man sitting over there listening for me. Okay, that's unbiasing. It's a great technique, whether it's social engineering or just having a better relationship with people. Learn the context of the person's thought processes. Are they visual? Are they saying words like see, paint? Can you, if you put, if you listen to those words, are you seeing a picture as a result of it? That's a visual person. If I'm a visual person, by the way, I think it's roughly 60% of people have a predominant visual system, just as an aside, so you can play stats if you want to sometimes. Um, if I'm a visual person and you start talking to me about hearing the sound of, sounds like, I will hear the words out of your mouth, but it would be nicer for you to speak them in Russian to me because I'm not paying attention to them. As a further aside, the big bulk of a lot of people in the world are visual feeling or auditory feeling. And they're one or the other principal dominant uh, structures. You rarely get somebody who's just one, okay? If you hear the word, I feel like it weighs heavily on me, that was dragging out, what's that? It's a feeling person. Now, what's this digital creature? Okay, I want everybody to stand up real quick. I want everybody to look at the room and everybody in it. That's the digital creature you're dealing with. The bulk of you in here have some sort of digital context. Go ahead and sit down. Digital context is a person who is using what I call neutral words or may use a chaotic usage of the other uh, systems, V, K, and A. In other words, they switch the context of seeing something to hearing something to feeling it all in one sentence or you know, right next to each other. 
That's a digital person. They're speaking very precisely. Digital people are people who tend to be extremely highly logical. They, um, they may or may not have a predominant system because of some sort of um, event that took place in their life, or they deal very um, abstractly with the world around them. A lot of surgeons, for instance, because they have to deal with you know, bodies that are bleeding blood and gunshot wounds and things like that, may be digital people, okay? Digital people are, a less, are kind of a submodality that people slip in from time to time. Um, a th another thing that you need to do with language, we kind of crushed on this, go from you want or I want or can you to metaphor. Metaphor would be, instead of you would want or will you, you will, you'd want to have that bigger room if you traveled 15 hours, wouldn't you? If I said that to you, you'd be far more wanting to give me a room than if I said, won't you give me that room? Notice how that shifts the context between how I approach somebody. It both gives me an out and it gives them an out. It's not taking a hammer and beating somebody with your questions. Here's a big one, people. Your biggest back trick in your social engineering back is ask. How many times do you just not ask? I have asked for a tank and had it handed to me. I didn't know how to drive it, but I did get unstuck the vehicle that I had stuck in this big mud hole as a result of asking for the tank, but I asked for a tank. Okay? Another big one of the basics, learn to use silence. Learn to use silence. Silence. A lot of you aren't going to get this because you're not old enough. It's a Ginsu knife of communication. It slices, it dices, it cuts. Okay? If you've got to say something negative, don't. Just use silence. It's far more profound than saying, you're a big idiot. You say something profound to me and I just go, you're not sure if you're a big idiot, but you feel like a big idiot now. <laughs> All right? Um, it also causes uncertainty, and uncertainty is an emotional hypnotic context that you can leverage. Did you hear that? Emotional hypnotic. When you're uncertain, you're susceptible. Okay? Use it a lot. And learn to detect and to de deliver the Deshaun smile. I'm fixing to show you, I'll flip it over to the slide. Okay, how many people in the room think the picture on the right is a real small? Thank you. How many people think that the picture on the left is a real small? How many of y'all are just chicken as hell and won't raise your hand about anything? <laughs> Thank you. All right. That's the real small. All of you wanted to say that, didn't you? Or most of you did, please tell me. Because we got to start way back at the beginning of just, okay. That's a real small. Why is that a real small? This, the eyes, exactly. Look at the eyes, look at the cheek, look at the engagement of the muscles around here. Deshaun was a psychologist who, you know, back in the day when we could do these fun things, hooked people's faces up to electricity to try to rep reproduce real smiles and showed these pictures to people and said, which is a real smile? And he discovered the characteristics of what made a real smile, okay? And believe it or not, at a deep, deep unconscious level, we respond to a real smile. It is disarming, it is one of our elements of truth detection, and it opens the door to rapport. Now, this girl's doing a hell of a job of trying to create a real smile over here, but she can't, can't she? So you might ask me, Luke, then how do we do that as good social engineers? Because A, you need to be able to detect when somebody's fixing to push the button up underneath the table and have you put on the floor, because they're going, yes, I'll do that for you. Call 911. 
I'll tell you a quick story. Or when they're actually going to do what I said. Um, and they're engaged with me, right? We need to detect that. We also need to know how to use that smile. So how do you get a good Deshaun smile? Anybody got an idea? No, you don't put itching powder in your underwear. Good, you guys are working here. Anchor, anchor one. Find something, find a context that can make you feel inside that, you know, Deshaun smile. And find a way to anchor that context into a mental cue that when you need to bring it on, you can bring it on. Mine's the Beverly Hillbillies. I don't know why, but that damn show <laughs> makes me just want to smile. I always said if I ever have cancer, I'm just going to sit there and play the Beverly Hillbillies over and over again until it cures it. I figure it will. Okay, go on to the next one. Um, the, so those are the basics. Those are things that you need to refine every day. You need to practice them. And yes, the Deshaun smile thing, you're going to have to look in a mirror and go, wow, that was ugly. 10,000 times until you get it down, okay? Anchor that context. Now we're going to talk about rapport. You'll read all sorts of things on rapport. If you read anything in, in sales stuff, neuro-linguistic programming, it talks about rapport, and it's at the fundamental. And honestly, whether you're on the phone, face-to-face, -face, whatever it is, if you're going to get them to do anything for you, you better use rapport. You better establish rapport. Now there's some really crazy, stupid things that they'll tell you about rapport like match their breathing, follow their body position, okay? I was interviewing a guy one day, and like 10 minutes into this interview, every time I did this, he did this. Every time I did this, he did this, you know? And I, I finally stopped the guy and I go, look, I'm really well trained here, and you're looking like an idiot. <laughs> you're not building rapport with me. And I don't know about you, I used to have a neighbor in one of my subdivisions I lived in. This guy could talk so slow. And I literally finished most of his sentences. And I think he took five breaths in an hour <laughs> by the way he talked. I could not match his breathing if I wanted to try. It would kill me. Now, what does it mean, match your breathing? The way a person breathes kind of dictates the speed they speak, and it kind of gives you a clue to those vin vin aesthetic, visual kinesthetic auditory modes, okay? Feeling people, kinesthetic people will breathe really slow, and they'll talk really slow. And this is because we're Southerners and we kind of talk slow. That doesn't mean we're all kinesthetic, okay? A medium kind of pace to breathing or speech tends to be an auditory mode. And a very fast pace where somebody's really, that's a visual mode, okay? Just as a, as a background. But in the sense of rapport, if they're breathing fast, you should kind of begin to pattern your breathing but don't try to take it to the same level if it doesn't work for you because you will look like somebody who's decided to put 20 cigarettes in your mouth and breathe at the same time. <laughs> if you're not a fast breather and they're breathing fast, try to shift in their direction. But shift the way that you can shift normally without looking like an idiot. Okay, don't overdo it. Let some of these other things like body position and language take you the further way. So body position, yes, reasonably we need to match body position. But if the person scratches their head and puts their leg up, you shouldn't go. Okay, and it's also a mirroring. So it's not, put your leg up. So if he puts his leg up like that, it's not like this. That's not mirroring, that's, it's like this. We're compatible, okay? But, Every time they change position, you're going to look like you know, a monkey on crack if you're trying to follow them. Change the macro position. So if they lean forward, lean forward. If they lean back, lean back. If they close their body off, close their body off. Don't try to read it necessarily. 
If they open their body up, open your body up. Occasionally throw in something they're doing. So if they lean forward on their chin, maybe that's an appropriate thing to lean forward on your chin. Slowly, the two of you, you'll actually find when you start doing these things, you'll actually start feeling this, the rapport back. You'll be going, man, I'm, I like this guy. Huh, this is cool, as you do this. But if you try to do it, like I said, a monkey on crack, you won't. Because you'll just be like speed reading through this thing. <laughs> okay? And then language. Start matching their language. If they're using a visual mode, use your modes, but add some visual to it. You know, I really feel like that will work for us, but I can see what you're saying about the changes that we might make. So I'm a kinesthetic person, but I just went to a visual mode. I added C. Match the context of the words with them. So, and the, the big key with this rapport building is pace and transition and integrate. If you're not feeling the pace happen naturally, you're not gonna transition to that mode that I just told you where you're both feeling it, and you're ultimately not gonna integrate. All right? Normally at this point in time, I'd have you guys try this, but we're running behind tonight, so let's go on to the next one. Eye reading. This is your lie detector. This tells you everything you need to know about a person. I tell you right now that I can beat every polygraph ever by telling you whether a person is true or false if I have five minutes to talk to them and then watch their responses just based on their eyes. Because eyes don't lie. Uh, my boss is in the room tonight. When he came in, I actually did a little eye technique on him. He didn't know it. He's going to go home tonight. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, he walked right by me. And I actually used the fact that I didn't look, even though I stand out because I was well, the only guy in the room with a suit on, for him not to see me. And that's a great thing. The eyes convey power, people. When I used to have to do a reconnaissance, and one time I had to sneak literally up, um, the guard was like here, and I'm laying on the ground with his ashes going down the back of my shirt as he was smoking, and lay there for a day and a half. The reason why I was able to do that, outside of having a lot of good camouflage on, I never looked at him. The eyes tell you and give you so much power in terms of a person. If you cannot make good eye contact in this room, you can't read IQs, and you won't be a good communicator, so learn to overcome that. I told my son, he was my older son, he was a little bit awkward dating, and um, I told him, look, I want you to go to school and the five most beautiful women in the school, as you walk by them in the hall, I want you to hold eye contact for five seconds. I said, I promise you by the, end of the, by the end of the day, you'll have one of their phone numbers. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. Two weeks later, he goes, Dad, that works. It does. Now switch over, let's go to the accessing cues. These are real. Learn this map. This is also for a right-handed person. Um, when you get these slides, it has a, a good thing that you could go look at and it's interactive. Basically, when people are in a visual frame of mind, their eyes are gonna be looking up. And whether they're constructing something, which means they're building it, the picture in their mind, or whether they're remembering, which is they're going into that memory and grabbing it, depends on which ways they go. Um, auditory typically is a midline movement of the eyes, and then kinesthetic and feeling are down. So how do you use this? Well, first off, you use it by just understanding those V, K, A, D concepts. Okay, they're visualizing it in their head right now. Okay, they're visualizing it. They're visualizing, okay, this is a visual person, right? The other thing is, this is where lie detection happens. If you have somebody, if, I, if we had enough time, I'd have somebody come up here and I'd go, okay, everybody watch this. I want you to tell me a story that's true. 
and I'd make you watch their eyes. Then I'd say, I want you to tell me a story that's false. Their eyes cannot match what they did when they did truth. More than likely when they tell you the true thing, they'll be hearing what's going on, they'll be feeling what it made them feel like. They may have to occasionally look at a picture. Normally when they lie, they've got to construct the hell out of that thing. So they're up there in visual constructive going, okay, what am I gonna say next? Okay, what is, how am I gonna describe that? It's like a stoplight blinking in your eyes when you learn that. Okay, flip over. Here's a powerful technique, disassociation. You ever wanna be a great pickpocket? Learn this. This is all pickpockets do. Disassociate, you ever want the best defensive technique that somebody's gonna beat your butt and you need to stop them right then? Learn this technique. All it is is making their brain process something it's not ready to process. That's all this is, okay? If I wanna steal somebody's badge because I wanna get into the facility, I'm not gonna walk up and go, let me have your badge. No. Hey, look at that beard. I could have walked away with that badge right there, okay? I scratched his beard. He's going, whoa. What the badge walks away, All right? Somebody's getting ready, and I've actually used this as a law enforcement officer several times. You know, somebody's getting ready. This guy that I engaged in the room that was wanting to kill me was a disassociation technique. Hey, let's have some skull. You're talking about killing me, let's disassociate from that and have some skull, okay? You want that two seconds that saves your life, ladies, when, you know, a big guy like me who is evil wants to actually do some bad stuff to you, that second when they're going to grab you, you know, say something just crazy, not scream, holler, just like, my pizza has shoes on, can we go get it? First off, if I'm attacking you, I'm suddenly wondering whether you're crazier than I am. <laughs> All right? And there's three types. There's kinesthetic, emotional. You know, you're dealing with a boyfriend or girlfriend. They're sobbing out of control. Laugh hilariously. Don't plan on getting any for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but it will change the context, I'll tell you that. Okay, go ahead. All right, anchoring. We're gonna go through these next pretty quick. Um, anchoring, all anchoring is is this classical conditioning. Take stimulus, get response. Take stimulus, get response. The power really behind anchoring is, and what people don't understand and, and misuse it, is they don't match the anchors to the right modalities. So if you're a visual person and I'm sitting there slapping you on the leg trying to anchor it, not gonna work. Not gonna work very powerfully. I need to deal with your visual cue. So maybe I just go, that's all my anchor may be. Okay, I got it. And I anchor what I want. That's number one. Number two is, don't go for the gusto right off the bat, people. You know? That's what everybody tries to do when they learn anchoring, is they try to go, okay, this is what I want, I'm gonna go get it with an anchor. No, you may have to go six steps. You may have to anchor him scratching his nose to getting up across the room and getting a glass of water, to sitting down and reading a book, to then handing you the ticket that you wanted to begin with. Secret of getting out of a ticket is actually an anchoring technique. I kid you not, um, you know, we were given the, given the riot act of, you know, not judiciously policing people who were drinking and driving, so we would all have to check these people. And it is unfoundedly consistent that when you stop somebody who's been drinking and you said, how much have you had to drink tonight, what's the answer? Beers. Two beers. Who said it? You win the prize. Two beers. I one night stopped a lady and I said, how much have you had to drink tonight, ma'am? I had four beers, it was over three hours, and I went, go home. 
Why did I do that? Whereas somebody who'd said two bears was getting out of the car at the very least. No, I knew that she took my anchor of knowing when somebody says two bears, it's a lie, and she de-anchored it. And she disassociated at the same time by saying four beers. I was like, what do I do with a person who's being honest with me? Go home. Okay. And anchoring works both ways. It works anchoring somebody and de-anchoring somebody. So you've got to think about that. So that tech support person that you're trying to bypass has a very high anchor, which is, I'm not giving anybody anything because they all act like buttheads to me. Don't they? So you got to de-anchor that first and then get them with rapport to the context that you want. Or take the anchors that are there and go sideways to where you want it to be. This takes a lot of practice. A very simple example of it, which you can all go home and try tonight. You can do it to yourself or you can have somebody help you out with this. Build a, the most profound, positive context that you have. Whether it's a trip to the beach, whether it's a time that you spent with a father or loved one, whatever it is, and then reach down in the middle of building that as intensely as you can, squeeze your leg. Do that two or three times. Tomorrow, when you wake up, squeeze your legs and don't, and then Determine how you feel at that. You're not, going to make, you're not necessarily going to flash right back to that moment, but see if you don't feel good, no matter whether you felt bad before. Now, that may not work for a lot of you because a lot of you may not, may not be kinesthetic at all, so squeezing your legs is not going to do anything for you. It's numb. So you may have to then try and go, okay, well, let me tap a spoon and try that. This will actually help you explore your own modalities and figure out what they are, but it'll start beginning to teach you. And I, I highly encourage you to anchor some positive things on yourself before you start trying to do anything with anybody else. Now, you can legitimately anchor people sitting down across from a table with them. I've done this in interviews and other types of things where you know, I'm not getting the speed out of responses or whatever. And so when they give me that speed, I'll do some repetitive motion or, you know, give them some sign. And then I just keep doing that sign to them and they speed up, speed up, speed up. So there's a lot of things that you can do with anchoring here. Okay, go ahead. That's pretty much it. I think I ran over. Sorry about that. I tried to push this on. Any questions? I anchored all of y'all to sleep. <laughs> I, can, I, think they've, I think they have a copy of them. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, it does. It, it's confrontational for a lot of people because that's the context. But mostly what it is, is it's divisional between people. And it's turned into confrontational because superiors use that context to create a confrontational authority component to it. That's great. That's wonderful. That tells you immediately what? Somebody tell me what that tells me about that person. Huh? He's kinesthetic. He has to move. Movement is kinesthetic. Secondly, that's an easy thing to mirror, so you just put your hands up in the air and create some hand puppets and talk to him back. <laughs> they don't have to make sense, believe it or not. Okay? But if you're doing this and he's doing this, y'all are like, you know, you might as well turn around to each other and face each other's back and talk to each other. You're not getting each other. You're not connecting. That's a rapport that you can add to that, okay? And knowing that he's moving his hands also kind of gives you a feeling of how fast he's talking. <coughs> 
what modality he's moving through as he's doing that, okay? <laughs> it's called a PJC. And if you haven't had another speeding ticket in three years, it's a wonderful little thing to use occasionally, okay? Um, okay, if you're dealing with the highway patrol, zero. I'm, I'm, on, I'm being honest with you. We, we, you know, as a police officer, I'm going to be very candid with you. We do have quotas. You know, and a speeding ticket is considered an arrest, so, and we have so many quotas for arrests that we have to do. It's not that if we don't have, you know, five a day that we're going to, like, go to jail ourselves, but our sergeant starts looking at us and going, you know. Highway patrol, the best thing you can do with the highway patrol is do exactly what you should, which is put your hands on the top of the steering wheel, you know, talk nice to them. The one thing you should never do in a speeding ticket scenario is acknowledge any crime. Just say, I don't know. Why did you pull me up? I wasn't sure. I, you know, I, I'll tell you one way I got out of a speeding ticket with a highway patrol. It wasn't in this state, so I don't know if it worked. Um, it probably gets you shot nowadays, as trigger happy as people were, but it worked then. So I came flying over this hill, I saw the highway patrol. My first thought was to keep on flying and find a side street and hide. But he whipped around, Phew, I saw him. So I immediately pulled over. That's one thing you don't want to do. You will piss an officer off if you do one of two things when you pull over. Pull over in a stupid place, you will piss them off and guarantee yourself two tickets. Make them ride for two or three miles until you pull over at your convenience, you get three tickets. <laughs> All right? But I immediately pulled over, and what I did is, as soon as he stopped his car, I jumped out of my car, went running back to his window. I said, thank God, I was about to fall asleep, man. If you hadn't have stopped me, I would have probably wrecked my car. <laughs> he looked at me for like five minutes. It was an eternity. He goes, well, son, there's a coffee shop down the road. You get in that car right now, and you get down there and get you some coffee. The reason why I get you shot nowadays is they're very, I mean, they want you to sit in a car. And that was a calculated risk on my part, um, but it was one I pulled off effectively that day. No, I mean, the, the one thing you can do with police officers, remember, here's what police officers get if the smart ones learn very quickly. So you deal with each other and other people all the time. The only time you deal with a police officer is when you got your ass beat, your house stolen, your stuff stolen out of your house, or you're getting a speeding ticket. So your context to a police officer is typically anchored very negatively, which means we know that, we come up, and we're guarded. So the more you can be conducive to that officer doing his job simply, easily, and fun, the better off you're going to be. I would say more than 50% of the time, the decision to give you a ticket or not is largely made. You can, if he's on the borderline with that, you might be able to flip him by being funny or not sarcastic, watch sarcasm. <laughs> Cops have a very low tolerance for that, okay? But being just, you know, easy to get along with. That's about the only thing I can tell you. And with the highway patrol, that's probably very close to zero. Anything else? All right. Yes? Well, uh, first, yeah. well, first off, um, some of your eye movements tell me that. You know, the way you constructed things was in a feeling modality. Um, secondly, you used words that were, uh, that were marginally feeling. If, if you had not been feeling, I would have contexted you as, as a modality of digital. Because you, you more than anything else, you, you were completely absent of visual or auditory things when you're talking about visual or auditory things. Which tends to put you in that mode of probably being a feeling type person. The auditory came about because of eye movement. That's mainly what I saw in that.
No, I'm actually the guy that's normally sitting back in the room just like watching people more than anything. Go ahead. It depends on whether you want to have fun or whether you want to make them feel like a jackass, to be honest with you. Um, I have made people dance around like monkeys on cocaine, who I detected were mirroring me. I would speed up my movements and I would like over, overdo them and, you know, and they'd be jumping around in their seat, you know, and I'd go from forward to back and forward to back and, and they're trying to follow me and, and you also get to a point where they're doing that so much that they're like, they're not hearing a word you're saying at that point in time. <laughs> so you can start adding stupid phrases in there like, you know, you're, you know, you got a green face today. And they'll just go, yeah, uh-huh. You know, so you can have a lot of fun with people like that. Yes, go ahead. Yes, good question, excellent question. So, Everything, this, when we talked about body language earlier, that's one of the things, the reason why I say defensive body language is only marginally useful, because it only takes a shade of anything to, to totally modify the meaning of that. Very similarly, everything up to the actual eye accessing cues, you have to like read the whole person and kind of understand, am I getting something that feels sane here? And if you don't, there may be some underlying issue going on. Now the eye accessing cues actually work pretty effectively even on people who are well beyond the norm. Now you do reach a stage with that where all of that stuff breaks up. But the, the thing that you gotta learn to do is not depend on any one of these things. You've got to, and that's what that unbiasing does, make you step back and look at this and go, okay, I'm seeing this guy go from visual auditory kinesthetic, visual auditory kinesthetic, video, Something's wrong with that, and people don't do that, okay? So maybe I need to turn that off and see what a bigger picture is going on here for a minute. Autistic people are really easy to pick up, even in the most subtle autism, not because of anything else other than they will demonstrate little subtle non-social things that you can go, that doesn't feel right. And those are the things that you start looking at. Um, I will tell you that once you get into abnormal behavior, about the only thing you can do with abnormal behavior people, and I'll tell you a real quick story, it's funny, and I hope I do not offend anybody who's religious in here, I meant nothing by it. Um, but you've gotta get into the context of the abnormal, abnormal behavioral person's head. That's the only thing you can do, and work inside that context. I, uh, <clears throat> I had two 80-year-old plus ladies who were going to have, sur the, one of the sisters, they were twins, were going to have surgery, but the one that was having surgery had a psychological disorder, so they had to put her on the psych floor for a week to stabilize her on whatever other med that they were going to use while they were doing the surgery. And I got to know her really well because every night she had monkeys in her room or something like that. The nurses wouldn't do this, but I'd just go in, shoo, monkey, get away, get away. Make her happy, she'd go to sleep, okay? And I think her name was Edna. I, I cannot remember for a life of me. But we got up to the surgery, so she got up to the surgical floor, had her surgery. You know, the doctor needed her to get up that day and walk, as they do with most people after they have surgery. And every time she would just, the nurses would just about get her to get up, her and her twin sister had this kind of, you know, dialogue thing going on, and, and the sister would, oh my God, she's gonna get hurt! And you know, the, the, the Edna would fall back in the bed, just limp. And so they called me up there like, Luke, she's got to walk. We cannot get her up. The sister keeps, you know, undermining this. We, she's got to walk. So I get her in there, and I had a little bit more rapport, and I thought I could. So I got Edna sitting up, and we started to stand up. And sure enough, the twin sister does this again. And Edna just goes limp, you know. And I'm sitting there thinking for a minute. And <clears throat> we had talked a lot about Bible and stuff and religious context. My father's a pastor, by the way, so... You know, I can talk religion with anyone pretty much. And so we had this kind of rapport going on. And I thought for a minute, I go, I got to get her up. So I looked and I went, 
Edna, do you believe in the healing power of Lord Jesus Christ? She goes, you know I do, Luke. We've talked about it. I said, look at me. I said, right now, I want you to understand this and believe this. Rise and be healed! I kid you not, this woman stood straight up and started walking. There were five nurses standing in the doorway going. <laughs> and the twin sister stopped her crap and was like, it's a miracle! <laughs> I just thought it was funny, actually. Uh, there's tons of good resources out there. That's why I use the, the language that I use for the best technologies. Um, you'll find a lot of information on neurolinguistic programming, a lot of resources around that. Um, language is something that you can probably spin off of some of those because they, neurolinguistic programming is very much about learning the language as well. Body language, believe about half the stuff, look at more of the offensive body language than the defensive because innately we have the, the kind of understanding of what body language means. We respond subconsciously to what we see, perceive in somebody's body language. If I'm like this, you're like, this guy's open, yeah. If I'm like this, you're like, this guy's closed, right? We do that. So those are, you'll see on the slides those names, go find them and you, yeah, there's tons of resources out there. Um, actually, uh, the best thing to do on that, uh, there's some sites for that, but there's some books you can find on Amazon that are just fun reading. They're old history of, of cons and con artists and the cons that they pulled off and the language they use and what they ended up doing and that whole gamut of things. And that's just fun reading, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. All right, guys, let's get done. I gotta go pick somebody up at the airport.